John 15 verses 1 through 11. Just before we start, just give you, let me give you the general context. And that is that Jesus, this is really a section where Jesus is giving his last words before he gets crucified. So he's encouraging his disciples. Remember, he's told them that he's going to be leaving. And even though he was uh, already presented himself as their hero, the Messiah, the King, he had proven over and over and over that he's the one. Yes, he's the one. And we need to remember ourselves that he is the one. He's the one to give us life, to give us hope, to give us everything that we need. He's the one. He's the one. He's the one. But in chapter 13, he began to reveal some very disturbing things, right? He was going to be betrayed. He was leaving. They couldn't follow him. And wait a minute, I thought, you're the one. We've put all our marbles on you. We've trusted you. And now you're leaving us? We can't go with you? And you can imagine the confusion. So in chapter 14, he starts encouraging his disciples. And he tells them, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, you believe also in me. Yes, I'm leaving, but I'm coming back for you. And I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. You just need to remember to obey my commandments because that's the way we're going to develop our relationship. While we are gone, while I'm gone, you need to obey my commandments. And we went through that. And so now he continues in his last words as he leaves. Uh, the rest of chapter 15, 16, and then in chapter 17, he actually prays to the Father. So he's continuing to encourage his disciples how to live this life when he is gone. When we know what to do, but he's not around physically. Right? And so he's going to continue to encourage his disciples. And here he says, you need to stay in constant awareness of my presence. Okay? Even though I'm gone physically, I'm with you spiritually. And that's a big thing, right? Because we are so caught up with the physical. With the physical. With the physical. Whether it's the wife wanting the husband physically there. And the husband wanting physically to show that he's got everything accomplished. His house or his monies or to provide for his family. Physical. And we need to remember that this is spiritual realities that Jesus is talking about. And that in itself takes a transition. But then when we don't do that and we're not aware of Christ, what happens? We begin to focus on the here and now. And we're not as concerned about the second coming of Christ. We're not concerned about the kingdom of God. And the world is constantly pushing to that, right? Get your education now. Get it all now. Get the money now. Get that new thing now. Because you might skip out. You might miss out. And our young people are being trapped all the time. Because just focus on the here and now. And not just the here and now. This earth only. We don't think about the coming kingdom of God that much. And so we're not moved by that. We start focusing again on the immediate. And the world wants you to do that because, because that means money for them. That means a profit for them. So they're going to continue to feed this uh, unsatisfiable uh, hunger within and the desire and demand for satisfaction now. And uh, it's a, a terrible thing. It's lies from hell that we've got to have it now. It's my happiness, my fulfillment. And no, it's a lie from hell. God created us for himself. And so 
the more we look away from ourselves and on to something bigger, and that bigger is God, then we're headed in the right path. But we so quickly forget. Even as Christians, we forget. And by the time we know it, we are uh, being pushed and pulled by the urgent things, the immediate things. And Jesus is saying, guys, I'm coming back and I want you to be very aware of my presence and you need to continue to obey me. Okay? But we focus on the earth, the earthly things. Right? So in Philippians chapter 3, by way of introduction, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17, Paul is talking to the Philippians and he's talking about himself that he needs to continue to, to push forward for the kingdom of God, to know Christ, to know him spiritually and in an ongoing relationship. And it's a struggle, right? But he tells them in Philippians chapter 3, and it is very, very instructive, brothers. Many times when I choose a scripture that I'm going to read and connect, believe me, there is a connection with the main passage that we're looking at. And here in Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, the Apostle Paul talking to the Philippians, writing to them, Brethren, join me, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, and by walking means they run their life, they base their life, the way they behave, what they shoot for every day, what, the way they walk, of whom I often told you and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. And what does it mean, enemies? Like, do they have machine guns? Like, is this ISIS coming after us? Well, what are these enemies? Are they really mean-looking people that are maybe dressed with horns and a red suit and a pitchfork? <laughs> no. It's real interesting how our enemies are. Look at this in verse 19. Whose end is destruction, who, whose God is their appetite and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. Wow. People that set their minds on earthly things are our enemies. Ooh. Doesn't have to be ISIS. People that set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly Wait for our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. That alone should make us meditate for hours. Am I moved by the second coming of Christ? There's many, many other things that move me more. Wow. Verse 21. The Savior who Jesus, when he comes back, he will transform the body of our humble state. And the older I get, the more humble my body gets. <laughs> I'm falling apart. You know, I just got over gout. Right? No more red meat. No more shrimp. That's it. No, I, what? Shrimp? Yep, no more shrimp. Okay, cut all that out. My gout is gone. And then I woke up and like, oh, 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 what in the world? Now my boat on the other side of the foot. It's like, <laughs> what is going on? But here, look at what it says. Verse 21, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. By the exertion of the power that has, uh, he has even to subject all things to himself. Wow. Do I believe that? Do I believe that? That when Jesus Christ comes, all my ailments, all my imperfections are going to be gone? Whether it's cancer, whether it's my bone, whether it's my bald headedness, I don't know. 
Well, that's what it says there. Man, if that's the case, if that is the case, then what in the world am I living for? Am I living just for this world? Satan loves for me to just live for this world. You see? And the world, the advertisers, everybody wants to, for me to live just for this world. And be concerned about my physicalness and all that. Now, is, this, is there a room for that? Well, yes. I need to take care of myself. And I need to be, but that should not be consuming me, driving me. It should be the kingdom of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ coming back. So, we need to ask the question. What keeps us from remaining in the things of God? The kingdom of God. Where are our energies being spent? Where is our body fo focused on most of the time? Uh, is it maybe my focus is way too much on my clothing? Our money? Our careers? Our likability. Ooh, that's a big one. Am I liked? Am I not liked? Am I going to get rejected? Or am I going to be accepted? Am I going to be funny? Or am I going to look stupid? And blah, 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 on and on and on. It's about me, 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 me. <laughs> and it's no longer about the Lord. See, we have to ask the question. What, what keeps us from remaining in the things of God. Because once you hear it, brothers, and sisters, I said it already. It's like, bing, yep, I'm supposed to be concerned for the kingdom of God. But we need to ask those questions so that we can look and say, well, what is driving me away? What's keeping me away? You see, I know it. I hear it on Sunday or Wednesday night, but then boom, all of a sudden, the rest of the world is coming in and taking me away from the things of God. And I'm no longer aware of Christ. Because you see, Jesus has a purpose for you and for me. He told his disciples, I'm leaving. And I'm going to leave you here with a purpose. It's not just so that you'll suffer and eventually, okay, you suffer enough, I'll take you to heaven now. No. There is a purpose that he gave us. So that we are, the reason why we're here on earth and we are called to live according to that purpose. And here in John 15, the first 11 verses, he gets at that. Here's your purpose for living. And if we're not living according to that purpose, very quickly we become weak, disoriented, angry, frustrated, lonely, and the list goes on and on and on and on. And we need to come back to live according to the purpose that he has for us. And right here in this passage, we are left here on earth to be part, listen to this, to be part of reproducing Christ's likeness through Christ. We are here on earth to reproduce and develop Christ-likeness in ourselves and others. That's what we're here on earth for. Because the more we become like Christ, guess what? We're going to represent God better. We're going to live according to sharing the gospel more. Reflecting the character of Jesus. His priorities. His values. We're going to be living just like him more and more. And so that's what this passage is about. That's our purpose here on earth, to reproduce Christ's likeness through Christ himself. So I say verse 1 and 2 of John 15 is really the setting. And the setting is a farm, a farmer, and plants, in particular a vineyard. Right? That's the setting. Um, verses 3 through 8 Christian's purpose. 
what's the purpose for Christians? And there it is. 9 through 11, how our purpose is accomplished. How our purpose is accomplished. Okay, so then the setting, it's a farm, it's a vineyard, it's a farmer. Uh, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. The true vine. The vine, it, it, it's, it's an analogy, right? But the vine provides what? Provides the sap. Provides the, the means of the transfer of nutrients and so forth over to the branches. I mean, without the vine, you've got nothing, right? Now, I am the vine. I'm the one that provides the energies, the sap for life. Right? And my father is the vine dresser. Now, many of us do not know much about vine dressing, about vines, but he does indicate here what, he, what it's about. Because see, if vines are not taken care of, you know what happens? It grows like wild and produces nothing. The vine just grows and grows and grows and grows like a jungle, but it's not producing anything. So the vine dresser has to come and say, okay, which part are not producing? Clip, 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 clip. Which one needs the encouragement? Okay, more water, less water, more. Hang them up here. Otherwise, it's going to grow like wild and no fruit. So my father is the vine dresser. And he says it right there. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit. <clears throat> and I want you to note. This is the context. Bearing fruit. Why, why is that important? Because many people misinterpret this passage. This is about being productive in the Christian life. It's not about salvation. Okay? It's very important. The contest is about producing in the Christian life. And once we get that context, and he repeats it several ways, uh, so we get the context. That's what it's about. It's not about this justification before God, whether you're a Christian or not, all this. No. It's about bearing fruit. And he says in verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away... And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it. And here's the purpose. Look at it right there. I'm not making it up. Right there. Lucy. So that it may bear more fruit. You see that? That's your purpose as a Christian. That's my purpose as a Christian. There it is. We thought, ooh, I thought it was to make more money. Oh, I thought it was to have a great career. Oh, I thought it was to have enough money to be secure. Oh, I thought it was to have a, a great marriage. That's the, end of, that's, that's, the one, that's, the, that's the ultimate. No, no, not going to hear. It's to bear fruit. Now, we're going to have to be careful. What does it mean by fruit? Because if not, you know what we're going to start doing? Well, you know. Mm, bearing fruit. Uh, minister to the, uh, to the widows. That's it. Minister to the widows. Is that good? It's very good. In fact, we're commanded to do that. Or, oh no, let's uh, mm, get involved with the abortion issue. Stop abortion. Stop abortion. That's it. And the more we stop that, that's the fruit. Mm, is that good? Very good. But we need to be very careful. What does it mean to bear fruit? And we're going to look at that. Right, But that's our purpose, brothers and sisters. We are here on earth to bear fruit and fruit for the kingdom of God. And sometimes we need to realign our thinking and our values. Because we're not living according to that purpose. Oh, every once in a while we'll kind of shoot this effort toward the kingdom of God. And oh, yeah, yeah, okay, oh, I have to. So boom, we do something for the Lord. Right? But that's not the ongoing drive. Other things in life get in the way and they consume all our time. You see? 
And so we have to be careful. So, there it is, the setting, the farm, and he's leaving us behind to produce, um, because when we do not, the vine just grows and grows and grows and very unproductive. Excuse me. Um, and it takes ex extensive pruning. The, the vine dresser has to be consistently looking at it, looking at it, looking at it. This branch starts to get dry, clip. This person is getting down, let's prop him up. Constantly, constantly watching the vine. Um, so now in verse 3, it begins to show the purpose. Uh, you're already clean, meaning you're already saved, right? Through the word uh, which I spoke to you. That's, that's not the concern here. Okay, we're, we're concerned about producing. Now, how in the world, uh, what does it mean? It means to abide. Abide, it says in verse 4. Abide. Abide in me and I in you as the branches cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. Abide, uh, an interesting word, and is different than being in. It's a difference, and, and I want you to note a couple of passages. Look at 14, chapter 14, and verse 17. Chapter 14 and verse 17. And as the spirit of truth, whom the uh, world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because, look at this, because look at this. It says what? Because he abides with you and will be in you. Uh, and then he says other passages that kind of highlight that. Uh, abiding has the sense of maybe... Uh, there's going to be this connection and maybe not. Being in a person, there's a permanence to it. You see? And so when Jesus says, abide in me, make sure that you're abiding in me. And what does that mean to abide? I try to use an illustration in my own mind. At home, uh, well, <clears throat> we just have now one left at the house, which is Desiree. Well, off and on the others. <laughs> but uh, when we all five were there, all the five children were there, Nancy and I, it was seven of us. And you know, when you have a family like that, you're very aware when somebody's there when they're not, right? So you get home and you sense, you, you're aware that nobody's there. You know, if nobody's there and all of a sudden, you know, you all of a sudden start feeling, wait a minute, somebody's here. We may not have seen them, but we're aware they're there. And sure enough, come around the corner. Oh, they arrived from work or they arrived from the store. Oh, okay. You're aware. And then, let's say two or three individuals arrived and you're aware, but Nancy is not there, my wife. And because she's working or going to the store, whatever. All right. So we're, we're aware that she's not there. And then she arrives. We're aware she's there. Right? The dynamics change. When you're aware that the other person is there, the dynamics change. Whether it's more stress or more happiness or what have you, things change because you're aware of their very presence. You see? Excuse me. So that's Jesus is saying, I want you to abide in me. I want you to live the life in such a way that you're aware of my presence. Now, let me tell you, brothers and sisters, if we live that way, it can revolutionize our lives. It can revolutionize our lives. You know, you might be looking at the Internet, and you're going to click on something you shouldn't. And if you're aware that Jesus is right there with you, you're not going to click. If you're going to say something that's not right. And you're very aware. Jesus is right here with me. Nah. No. 
I'm not going to say it. Even though that dog deserves it, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> because it's not loving. You see what I'm saying? And that's what Jesus is saying right there. Uh, <clears throat> verse 4, abide in me. Be aware that I'm always with you. You see? And when you do that, you're going to be fruitful. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. And you can imagine, here's the vine. It's got all these branches. And all of a sudden, this branch is by itself over here. Not connected to the vine. Is that branch going to bear fruit? No. No, it's not. So that's what Jesus said. You stay connected so, with me. To stay connected with Jesus, to be aware of his presence. Otherwise, we're not going to bear fruit. Uh, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches, verse 5. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. What do you mean nothing? I get up in the morning and I'm, I brush my teeth. I take a bath. I put my clothes on. I don't see you walking around putting my clothes on. Let's not get ridiculous. What is he talking about? Remember, remember, Jesus is not here physically. So he's talking about spiritual realities. He's talking about character. So without me, you can do nothing that really matters. You can do all kinds of things in life, but the things that really matter, the spiritual things, you can do zip. You see that? I'm not making it up. Without me, you can do nothing. It doesn't say you can do, you can't do 90%. You can't do 95%. You can't do 99%. You can't do nothing. <laughs> that really matters. That's why it is very, very critical that we stay aware of Jesus' presence. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away uh, as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Now, this is why very important that this context is about being productive. It's not about salvation. People try to make it, well, you see, thrown into the fire, man, thrown into hell. <laughs> no. What is he saying? You become useless. Can you imagine living a life of uselessness? And many times, even as Christians, we feel useless. Why? Why? Because we're not really living for the kingdom of God. We have lost focus. And we're just living for self. Am I going to be respected? Am I going to be loved? Am I going to have enough? Am I, be, am I going to be noticed? Am I going to be popular? Am I going to be taken care of? Oh, they're treating them better than me. Uh, and here we go. Here we go. Right? Because we're no longer thinking about the kingdom of God. You see? We're no longer thinking about the kingdom of God. And so we become useless. We're still breathing. <sighs> we're still breathing. We still eat. We still have all kinds of emotions. And we might even do a lot of things for Jesus. But if it's not out of the right motivations, if it's not really focused on the kingdom of God, because many of us can do all kinds of things to impress other people. You see? No. It really has to come for the kingdom of God. Otherwise, we become useless. Wow. That can be pretty discouraging. And that's why it goes back. It's very, very important to stay aware that Jesus is right here with me. Very, very critical. Uh, if you abide in me, and my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Okay, here we go. 
And are those passages that are misapplied all the time, right? Misapplied all the time. Very, very important to look at the context again. Because if we do not look at the context, it says right there, the last part of verse 7. Look, it says right there, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Jesus, give me hair in my head. Poof. <laughs> Jesus, deliver me from cancer. Poof. Jesus, give me that job. Poof. And many, many teach that way. Very important to look at the context here. And what's the context? Fruit bearing. And when we're asking about fruit bearing for the kingdom of God, Jesus will do it. When we have the right values and the right perspective. You see how important it is, brothers and sisters, to look at the whole passage? Not just take one verse out of context? Because they can quote it. They're quoting the Bible. It says, ask whatever you wish. <sighs> mm. You're going to be fruitful, it says. Um, if you ask. Now, before we go on, <clears throat> uh, let me look at this fruit again. What is this fruit? I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. Uh, <clears throat> because once again, to understand what God is talking about and not be misled, not be thrown off, Isaiah 5, starting in verse Isaiah 5 verse 1. one. Let me sing now for you, well beloved, a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. Hmm. My well beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. Around, removed he his dug stones it and planted it with the choicest vine. And he built a tower in the middle of it. And also hewed out a, a, a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. And now, O oh inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. <clears throat> what more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? <clears throat> Why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, it did it did, uh, did it produce worthless ones? So now let me tell you what I'm going to do with my vineyard. I will remove its hedges and I will be, and it will be consumed. It will break down its, uh, I will break down its wall and it will become trampled uh, ground. I will lay it waste. I will not be, uh, it will not be pruned or uh, hoed, but briars and thorns will come up. I will also charge the clouds to rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, the people of God. And the men of Judah, his delightful plant. Thus he looked for justice. That's the fruit. He looked for justice. But behold, bloodshed for righteousness. But behold, a cry of distress. What's the fruit? Justice and righteousness. That's Christ-like character. You see? That's what Christ is wanting to produce in us as we abide in him. It's Christ-likeness. You see? Because when we develop Christ-likeness, then guess what? There's going to be physical fruit that comes. We're going to do good works. But there's going to be out of Christ-likeness. Very, 
Very important. Because we can get thrown off by this. Jesus, you cannot produce life on your own. Uh, Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. When, well, Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. This is when uh, John the Baptist was preaching and the Pharisees came from Jerusalem to meet with him. And look at the way he responds. Matthew 3, starting verse 7. But when he saw, that is, John the Baptist saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to bab uh, for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Wow. Brokenness and humility. That's the fruit. Wow. It's not so much of, you know, because we can get lost in doing things, doing things, doing things for the kingdom of God, and yet it's not from the right motivation. It's not out of the right character, out of pressure and religiosity and legalism. No, the fruit is about the Christian character, Christ-like character. Remember that famous passage? Hey, Lord, uh, <clears throat> we cast out demons in your name. We did all these things. Get away from me. I never knew you. Wow. Something's up with the motivations, right? Something is up with the motivations. Uh, Galatians 5. Galatians 5. I need to keep using or bringing up these scriptures because this is something that's very, very important. And for you to see about what, what is this fruit. Galatians 5. And starting in verse 22. Galatians 5 and verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such thing there is no law. Wow! The fruit of the Spirit. Is Christ likeness. You see? And when we have Christ likeness, we're going to move with love. We're going to move and, and love others in such a way that we're going to speak to them about God. Help the widows and the orphans and all that. But it's going to be out of Christ likeness, not out of religiosity. You see? Very, very important. And if we don't do that, we become useless. We become useless. Uh, and so we have our ultimate purpose now given to us back in John 15 and verse 8. Why do all this? And, and by the way, it's very, very important too. Why do we do all this? Look at verse 8. And if we're not moved by verse 8, it ain't going to work. It's going to be out of pressure. Look at verse 8. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. You know? Why do I want to live the Christian life? Because uh, I'm going to be happier? Because uh, I'm going to be more fulfilled? Because uh, people are going to listen to me? Because uh, my children are going to grow up godly automatically? Because mm, my wife is going to respect me and love me more? No. No. The ultimate purpose is because God is glorified. That's why. Because you see, thorns and thistles are going to continue. 
frustrations and people are still going to make up their own mind and sometimes no matter how much we love them no matter how much we speak the truth to them they're still going to choose against the truth against God what did God say in Isaiah 5 what more could I do he did everything for Israel and he still produced bad grapes. And so this verse 8 is very, very key. The Father's going to get glorified. That's the ultimate motivation, you see. And in the process, in the process, you're going to prove that you're my disciples. You see. But the ultimate, the ultimate is to glorify the Father. That's why we're here on earth. Glorify the Father. How? By producing fruit. And what's the fruit? Christ likeness, godly character, love, joy, peace, gentleness, self control, godly character. You see? That's what we're here on earth for. Uh, how is our purpose actually accomplished? Verse 9. What's the motivation again? Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. I tell young people, why should you obey the Ten Commandments? Why shouldn't you look at pornography? Why shouldn't you use the F word? Because just the Bible says so. If, we just, if that's the only answer, brothers and sisters, that's not good enough. We need to understand why Jesus said what he said. Why does the Bible say what it says? Because it's against the character of God. Because it's against love. When things are not moved by love, it's God is love. Our behavior is just religiosity. Just performance. So that I can get an A for today. Oh, you did good. Where was love? I don't know, but I did good. <laughs> And it just develops into pressure, 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 pressure. And it's never, 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 ever good enough. Under pressure all the time to do better and better and better. Oh, I can't make a mistake. I can't make a mistake because I'm going to be nailed. I'm going to be judged. I'm going to be demoted. I'm going to be written up. Where's love? I don't know, man. Don't talk to me about love. Can't you see how hard I'm working? <laughs> And our motivation is all messed up. So Jesus says, uh, just like the Father loved me and I love the Father, so I love you. You see? And out of that love, because there's love, abide in me. Live in such a way that you're aware that I'm with you. But it's all because of love. Not pressure. Uh, because of love then you're going to keep my commandments verse 10 if you keep my commandments you will abide in my love just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love isn't that something? it's love it's love love that's based on truth love that's based on sacrifice not the ooey gooey mushy uh, intense emotional reaction because there's some beautiful thing out there. No, this sacrificial love that says I'm going to do what is best. Even I have to die. I'm going to do what's best for the other person. And what's best for the other person is to help them live the will of God in their life. You're going to keep my commandments when there is love. Abide in my love because that's the game in town. 
And then Jesus says, all these things. Look at verse 11. This is a beautiful, beautiful verse. Verse 11. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Oh my, talk about life, the real life, the substantial, abiding, deep and profound and powerful life. That's the joy I want you to have. And we go for the superficial stuff. It doesn't abide. Jesus says, I want the joy, my joy to abide in you. Uh, this joy, uh, <clears throat> it's a, a mysterious thing. Pain is experienced, but when you look at the end product, then you say, I'm willing to go through this point, through this pain. This is what Hebrews 2, uh, Hebrews 12 verse 2 talks about. When it says that Jesus, because of the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He was looking at the end product. And what would be the end product? You and I. Becoming more like him and connected to God the Father who is love itself for all eternity. He was looking at that in product. And he says, because that's going to happen to my children, come on, bring it on. Go ahead, the nails on my hand, because I know what it's going to produce. I have a very homely illustration for that. When Nancy went, when my wife Nancy went into labor with our first child, Stephanie, it was 44 hours of hard labor. 44 hours of hard labor. At the end, Stephanie's heartbeat, the baby's heartbeat was racing. And Nancy's temperature spiked way high. And the doctor said, if we don't do a C-section, they may both die. Mm. 44 hours. And I was with her. Oh. She had the baby. When they brought her to her, it must have been, I don't know, five seconds, 10 seconds. Nancy looked at me and she said, um, I need to get ready for the next one. God, man, like what in the world, woman? The joy of the baby. The joy. Unbelievable. Stephanie's name is Stephanie Joy Martinez. Stephanie means crown. Crown of joy. But she went through the pain. And she was willing to go through it again. Because she knew the joy that was coming. Jesus is saying, I want you to experience this joy eternal profound the real joy you need to abide in me that's the way to experience the joy because I'm doing it now Jesus says I'm being rejected you're gonna fail me you're gonna betray me but I'm still because I know the end product you see and you and I are called to live the Christian life because it produces Christ-likeness and it glorifies God and ultimately it does give us joy eternal. So, to apply, look at Hebrews chapter 12. 
Hebrews chapter 12 as our first application. Hebrews chapter 12, and starting in verse 1. Therefore, since we have so, such a great cloud of witnesses, and that's all of chapter 11, surrounding us, let us also lay aside, lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. So, what sin besets you? What takes you away from thinking about Jesus throughout the day? What takes you away from living for the kingdom of God? I'm not talking about leaving your career. I'm not talking about leaving your vocation as a wife or as a husband. No. In whatever you do, do it to the glory of God, for the kingdom of God. But we need to look what, what entangles us. What takes us away? We need to fix our eyes on Jesus. Uh, John 15, 4. Abide in me. And by the way, it's an imperative. It's a commandment. Abide in me. There's no other way. You can't do it on your own. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Focusing on the end product. And what's the uh, end product? Christ-likeness. And thus, when we become more like Christ, we're going to help others. To know Christ. To live for Christ, to live like Christ. So fixing our eyes on Jesus. Uh, right there in Hebrews 12, second application, Hebrews 12 and verse 12. Hebrews 12 and verse 12. Uh, therefore, Strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. He's using the analogy of a body. And some of us know, some of us have bad knees and we know exactly what that means. You know, and arms or what have you. And, but that body is being used as an analogy of the church, the body of Christ. So when it says in verse 12, therefore strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble, who can you help? Help in their sanctification. And make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many are defiled. And there be no immoral, godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. Wow. Wow. There comes a time when you have said no to God enough and there's no turning back. That's a, that's a serious warning. A serious warning. You have some bitterness against someone? Get rid of it. Talk to God and say, God help me. You're the only one that can melt the heart of stone and change the leper spots. I need you bad, God, because I have bitterness in my heart. Or somebody else that you know that are bitter. They're walking in an ungodly way. How can I be of help? Strengthen them. Confront them in a loving way, whatever it takes. You see? 
pursue sanctification because that's the way to life. What is sanctification? Being set apart for God's use. Being, being special for God's use. You're into things that you're not supposed to. You're dirtying yourself. And you're dirtying those around you. You're polluting. No. Set aside. Pursue sanctification for God's use. And it's not just to you, brothers and sisters. I have to do that for myself as well. Sanctification, pursue peace. Keep your focus, your fix your eyes on Jesus, abide in Jesus, pursue sanctification. And then it says, press on, Philippians 3. Philippians chapter 3. We started off in Philippians 3. Philippians 3, verse 12 and 13. The Apostle Paul says, Not that I have already obtained it, meaning, and he was the Apostle Paul, it's not that I'm already perfect. There's been many attempts throughout the Christian church where people have attempted to not acknowledge the fallenness of our world, not acknowledge, put aside the, the sinfulness, the Gnostics, way, way back when the church was starting, was already there. The spirit is good, the body is bad. So whatever you do with the body, no big deal, because it's really the only spirit that matters. No, no. Monasticism. Separate yourself, be alone, get away from the world, and you're going to be holy. No, that doesn't work. Lately, identity in Jesus Christ you have your identity in Christ. You don't have to worry about sin anymore because Jesus paid for it all. It all sounds good and there's truth to it. But when you minimize the, the struggle with sin, something is up. And throughout the church, there's Christians that have attempted to do away with the struggle of, with sin. Now, Paul says, I press on. Verse 12 of Philippians 3. Not that I have already attained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Jesus Christ. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. And that verse is not saying you don't look back into your history to see how you develop sinful patterns of life. But you no longer go by those experiences. You learn from them. But you press on to Christ-likeness. You press on because God is with us. But that's what we need to do, right? Because we can't do it alone. That's the whole, that's the whole point of, of, of uh, John 15, the first 11 verses. You can't do it. Abide in me. Being constant abiding in Christ. And I want you to notice once again, this is spiritual. This is spiritual. Uh, not physical as with just on this earth. It includes the physical, but it's not the focus on the physical. So how do we abide in Christ? What's going to help us? Abide in Christ. Well, here's a few things. Okay, ready? I'm going to just give you a quick list of things that can help us abide in Christ. Number one, talk to others about the Lord. Talk to others about the Lord. It's amazing. When somebody teaches something, it doesn't matter what it is. Usually they learn five times more than the student. Because they're talking about it. They're teaching it. Or talk to others about the Lord. And you find yourself abiding in the Lord more. But if we don't talk to others about the Lord. We're going to be talking about a whole bunch of other superficial meaningless stuff. And sometimes superficial stuff is okay. In fact, sometimes superficial stuff is loving. You just don't walk up into somebody and say, who are you wrestling with? You're going to go to hell? <laughs> what in the world? You know? Uh, but talk to others about the Lord. That's one. Here's another. How about listening to music that reminds you of the things of the Lord? 
music that reminds you about the things of God, good, substantial, awesome music that reminds you about the things of God, that reminds you about Jesus. How about having a, a single page devotional? Maybe not a whole page, maybe just a paragraph, a day that reminds you of the things of God, one little paragraph. Something that's going to help you abide in Jesus. Uh, and then prayer, of course. Jesus said it right there, no? Ask in my name. Ask for what you wish. Pray. Pray. How about reading scripture? Reading scripture. Maybe you read a psalm a day. A proverb a day. Think about it for a few minutes. Why, why did Jesus say that? Why did God say that in the proverb? That proverb. Something to help you abide in Jesus. Um, here's another one. Look around your workplace, the people you're with, your relatives, and ask the question, I wonder what God is doing in that situation. I wonder what God is doing with that person. I wonder what God is doing in that over there. Be looking for God's presence and you'll be amazed. But are you looking? Are you looking? You see, abide in Jesus. Abide in Jesus constantly and do things that are going to help you abide in Jesus Christ. We were left in this earth for that purpose. That we would be producing Christ-like character through the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah.